Open any major news source, and what do you see? We see Trump, we see Brexit. But 30 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people are going to look back at now, and they're not going to be talking about Trump, they're not going to be talking about Brexit. But what they are going to be saying is that now was the moment when after 3.8 billion years of evolving by the set of rules we call Darwinian evolution of random mutation and natural selection, this was the moment when our species took increasingly active control of our own evolution. Think about that for a moment. Think about how profound that is. When Watson and Crick identified the double helix structure of DNA in the 1950s, what they were doing was identifying that the Book of Life had a structure, and the structure was the famous double helix. And with the fruition of the Human Genome Project in 2003, what we were doing was identifying that the Book of Life could be read in the A's and C's and T's and G's of genetic code. And now at the dawn of the age of human precision gene editing, with tools like CRISPR, we're recognizing that the Book of Life can be written. When we think about technologies that are readable and writable and hackable, we think about information technology. As a matter of fact, we recognize the variability of our IT so much that we have a built-in assumption that every new version of our iPhone is going to be better and stronger than the last one. And yet, for some reason, we think about our biology as being fixed. But why do we think that? Somehow, we evolved from being single-cell organisms almost four billion years ago to this. And we've only been Homo sapiens for around 300,000 years. And yet, it's all we know. But with these tools of the genetic revolution, we are going to be able to fundamentally transform our biology. And this is going to create wondrous, amazing opportunities for us. Every time a young child dies of a terrible genetic disease, we recognize that as a crime against potential. But when a 90-year-old gets dementia, that's a crime against potential, too. Think of the investment that we have made in people. You have a whole life of developing your knowledge and your wisdom and your relationships. And when that goes away, we all suffer. And we are developing tools that are going to expand our humanity, expand our potential, and we need to welcome that. But we also need to recognize that there are dangers associated with developing these Promethean technologies that are giving us powers that in the past we have attributed to our gods, the power to make and remake life. And that comes with a tremendous responsibility because the genetics revolution is coming very, very quickly, and we aren't ready. And in order to make sure that we optimize the incredible benefits that are coming our way, we've got to be. So there are three key areas where we are all going to be feeling the impact of this fundamental change. The first, and probably the most obvious, is in our healthcare. When people think about genetics now, they think about healthcare for some very good reasons. But if this is, genetics is going to fundamentally transform the entire paradigm of healthcare. Right now, when you go see a doctor, you are treated based on the principles of generalized medicine, meaning you are treated because you are a human with an N of about 7 billion. But that is going to change because as we are able to look under the hood of each individual human, your treatment is going to be based on the individual biology of you. And that's why when you take a drug, it's not going to be a drug that works on average for humans. It's going to be a drug that works potentially for you based on specific knowledge of your own biology. And the foundation of that biology will be your sequence genome, which will be part of your electronic health record. So what's that going to mean? Well, as more and more of us have our, sequence geno our genomes sequenced as part of this transition from generalized to precision healthcare. We're going to have millions, then hundreds of millions, and within 10 years, about 2 billion people will have had their whole genome sequenced. And then, with the genotypic information, what our genes say, and the phenotypic information of how those genes are expressed over the course of our lives, 
And using big data analytic tools, we are going to be able to decipher more and more of the secrets of the genome. And that is very quickly going to transform our healthcare from the paradigm of precision medicine to predictive medicine. Right now, what we call healthcare is really sick care. You go to your doctor with a symptom, but maybe that symptom has been germinating in your body for 10 years, 20 years, maybe your whole life. And maybe when you go to see your doctor, it's so late in the process, your doctor can't do anything. But what if when you're taking your child home uh, from the nursery after just being born, the doctor says, here's your child, take him home, but just FYI, your child has a 70% greater than average chance of getting early onset Parkinson's or familial Alzheimer's or type 1 diabetes. Right now, you say, oh my God, why are you telling me this? This is torture. But it's actually really useful information. If you knew that your child uh, had an increased susceptibility to, ty to type 1 diabetes, wouldn't you want to instill in him or her a, sense of ha a series of habits of exercise and diet? If you were at risk or your child was at risk for some terrible disease, wouldn't you want to keep an eye on what progress was being made in treating that disease? Wouldn't you want more tests if you knew you had a greater susceptibility to breast cancer at some point in the future? Everybody is going to, to want this, uh, this information. But as we move toward universal sequencing, our understanding of genetics and genomics is going to move way beyond the realm of healthcare. And that's the second critical application will be through direct-to-consumer genetic information that has nothing to do with healthcare. We don't have a disease genome. We don't have a healthcare genome. We have a human genome. And that means that as we understand the secrets of the genome, we aren't just going to understand more about our disease states. We are going to understand more about the essence of what it means to be a human being. Our most intimate traits, the way our brains function, our personality styles, anything that has a genetic component, and there certainly are many traits that are mostly genetic and partly genetic, we will be able to increasingly understand the genetic component of those traits. So that's going to mean a lot. Because remember, taking your kid home from the nursery with the information about disease risks, what if you have information that your kid has a better than average potential at being amazing at abstract math? or sprinting, or having an outgoing personality? Will you send them to drama school because you have that information? How will that affect how we think about what it means to be a human being, how we think about parenting? And then the third and most profound application of these technologies will be in a fundamental transformation of, uh, in the way that our species reproduces. Right now, about 2% of uh, children in the United States are born through a process called in, in vitro fertilization, IVF. Um, it's about 10% in Denmark. And now, when you have IVF, when a woman has IVF, uh, these embryos, the pre-implanted embryos, can be screened for mostly single gene mutation diseases and disorders, things like Tay-Sachs and sickle cell disease, chromosomal abnormalities, and simple traits like hair color and eye color and, of course, gender. And all of that is, in some, certain, in some instances, controversial. But when we have more and more of this information about complex genetics, it's not going to be making selections based on just this limited information. We already have the ability to rank, let's say, let's call them 15 pre-implanted embryos from likely tallest to likely shortest. Within about 10 years, we're going to have the ability to rank them from likely highest genetic component of IQ to likely lowest genetic component of IQ. We'll be able to rank likely most outgoing, again, it's not an entirely genetic trait, to likely least outgoing. You see where this is heading. We are touching the core of what has been the mystery of what it means to be a human being with these technologies. But right now, our ability to select embryos is limited by the number of eggs that a human female 
produces. I mentioned 15, which is the rough average. But what if you could have more? And there is a technology that is already being applied to animals of taking an any adult cell, but a skin cell is often the easiest one. And so you take a skin graft, you induce those skin cells into stem cells using a process for which Shinya Yamanaka won the 2012 Nobel Prize. So now you have, let's call it, 10,000 cells that have been turned, uh, skin cells into stem cells. Stem cells then induced into egg precursor cells and egg precursor cells into eggs. So now you have 10,000 eggs and you fertilize them with the male sperm because there's about a billion sperm cells in every male ejaculation. And now you have 10,000 fertilized eggs. And in a machine, you grow them for about, 10 day, for about five days. You extract a few cells from each. You sequence those cells, and the cost of genome sequencing has gone down from about a billion dollars in 2003 to about $800 now to negligibility within a decade. So that doesn't cost anything. And then you get a spreadsheet. And in the spreadsheet, you have all of the options for your 10,000 embryos. And when you're starting with 10,000, you have a lot of options. How far can we go with this? Well, our ancestors, who knew nothing about genetics, took proud, wild wolves and turned them into yapping chihuahuas. <laughs> Imagine how far we can go with the knowledge that we have about how genetics works and how biology works. We can go a very, very, very long way. And on top of that, then we have these unbelievably power tools of precision gene editing like CRISPR. Many of you know that in 2018, a Chinese scientist, uh, an unethical Chinese scientist in my view, uh, was the first person to genetically engineer two little girls, two, any humans. And those children uh, were born in, in, um, in October 2018 in China. And this was a rogue scientist, but had he even not done what he did, still, two years from now, three years from now, we would anyway have had the first application of precision gene editing to a pre-implanted human embryo that would, would have been taken to term. We aren't going to be starting from scratch and creating babies out of a computer, but we will be making small numbers of gene edits, whether it's one, two, three edits, five edits, maybe 10 edits. I don't think that we're going to be making 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 uh, gene edits to a pre-implanted embryo uh, within the next couple of decades. And what is that going to mean? Because we are going to make changes, in most cases, to eliminate terrible and perhaps deadly risks. And people have a gut feeling, well, it's okay to eliminate risks, but we don't want to do things that feel like enhancement. But there will not be a clear boundary between those two poles. All of life will be in that gray area because it is all about perception. And these incredibly powerful tools will exist in the context of us, of our community, of communities, of our cultures. And we are all different. Within our societies, people have all kinds of views, ranging from extreme uh, people with strong religious views who have a strong aversion to quote unquote, playing God, to transhumanist biohackers who think it should be all systems go and everything in between. And how will societies figure out how to balance those different desires and interests. We're also different na in, uh, nationally, that there are countries that have strong Judeo-Christian backgrounds that may have one view about the permissibility of messing with nature. Other societies may have different views. How do we think about sinking these different views? And if that isn't hard enough, we are doing it in a world driven by extreme competition. We have extreme competition within our communities. I have a friend who is Korean and lives in Seoul. He has 12 students, I'm sorry, 12 tutors coming to his house every week to tutor his 11-year-old girl. Korea has a law 
making it a requirement that cram schools close every night at 10 p.m. because so many people were having their seven and eight-year-old kids stay out past midnight seven days a week preparing for exams they were going to take a decade in the future. When I asked my friend if you could sort your pre-implanted embryo, embryos to give your future child a 10 to 15 point IQ boost, would you do it? He looked at me like I was insane. Like, why would you even ask that question, obviously? <laughs> and then I said, how about everybody else who are the parents of kids in your school? And the look on his face didn't change. And that may be culture-specific, subculture-specific, but we have all of these different cultures, and people will have different desires. And if that's not complicated enough, what happens when different countries have different entire approaches to using these technologies? Imagine one country, call it the United States, decides to opt out. Another country, let's call it China, decides to opt in because it perceives an economic or competitive or other benefit. What would the opt-out country do? One thing, you could, one thing is you could imagine they would say, well, we've made our decision, you've made your decision, let's see how it plays out. And we don't know how it would, it would play out. But people will be afraid of that because what if that other society has some kind of big advantage that the society, the society that's opted out doesn't have? What do you do? So you could try to say, well, we'll try to build a global standard, which is a great answer, but it's hard to do. But what if you try to pressure that other country and they don't change? Do you make it illegal for your citizens to procreate with people from that other place? Do you use force to try to get them to stop? Imagine all the crazy things humans have gone to war over in our history. Is this one? I don't know, it could be. And the ethical issues around this are so deeply profound that they, they hit us all. And what we are talking about is messing with very complex systems we don't remotely or fully understand. There are equity issues. Who has access? And every technology has a first adopter. That's the nature of technology. But we've seen what happened when European powers, for example, uh, had slightly better weapons and slightly better ships than everybody else. It led to the colonial, uh, colonial era. What will happen if there are real or perceived differences between people? And diversity. We think about diversity as a great way to have better workplaces and universities and schools. But it's something much deeper. From an evolutionary perspective, from a Darwinian perspective, diversity is just random mutation. You could say if it weren't for diversity, we'd still be single-cell organisms, but you'd be wrong. Because if we didn't have diversity, those single-cell organisms could never have survived once the environment changed. Because there's not good or bad in evolution. There's just suitability for a particular environment. And diversity is our investment in being ready for a future scenario that we can't predict. And we're going to have to make big decisions before we fully understand the long-term implications of the decisions that we are going to have to make. We now have a tremendous responsibility, but also a great opportunity to bring our best values to bear in shaping this technology that is going to shape us. And I invite you to join me. Thank you.